Hello there. Greetings, salutations, and welcome once again, listeners, to another installment of the Spirit Radio. Yes, we're back again for another night broadcast for all you eager listeners. Night time is our time. Time to tell and share and shiver and scream. For we are the radio show seeking out the tales of terror for all of you still negotiating the night. And for those who can't sleep, let me assure you that we'll continue to keep you up more than any dose of caffeine could. There's no need to fear the ground giving way beneath your feet, as Nishi wrote. But rest assured, you will still be terrified to your very toes. (laughs) But that, of course, relies on you, dear listeners, does it not? The switchboard's as silent as a grave at the moment. If anyone wants to take the time to call in, our line is free and we'd love to hear from them. You see, I, your grateful host, am here ready to accept your calls. People want to hear you. People want you to take the time to pick up the phone, your cell phone, to borrow a phone from a friend, and call us up. Our show relies on your stories and terrifying tales to tell. Here, we won't judge. We won't question. Surely there must be one or two of you out there just dying to tell someone about something you daren't share with your friends or family. To those who were here for our first broadcast, you know that we hand the microphone to you, dear callers, and let you be the storyteller. Those little events where you saw a face at a window, when you too many floors up for it to just be a passerby or when you can't shake the feeling that it wasn't just a cold breeze on your neck, but was more like cold breath. Or perhaps something even more sinister reached out and caught you in its grasp, leaving you always wondering if it'll catch up to you again. (laughs) These are the tales you're desperate to share, and believe me, trust me, We want to hear you tell them. Someone's decided to do exactly that. We have a caller ready and waiting to share their story with us. Wonderful news. Excellent news. Hello, dear caller. You're on the air with the Spirit Radio. You know, I tried to call last time, but you had to go before I got the chance to tell my story. Which is why you get priority this time, dear caller. Already a fan and long-term listener? I wouldn't be a good host if I didn't listen to you first when I couldn't hear you last time. Wait, I never told the woman there that I got cut off. How did you know to put me first? Come now, Cola, does it matter? Don't fret when it's your time now. This is your chance. Seize it. Make the listeners tremble with your tale. The microphone is yours. Well, I wanted to say that I really liked the last show. It's really relaxing to be able to have something to listen to when I go to sleep at night. I've had a bit of an experience in the past, a pretty severe one. It's not spooky, but I think it's still pretty terrifying, so I hope that's okay. Not about ghosts, but in a way I guess that makes it feel a little bit worse. Who am I kidding? It makes it feel a lot worse. Take your time. No rush at all. Thank you. Um, a few years ago, I used to hang out with this friend of mine from school. We've known each other for most of our lives, her and her little brother. We stuck by each other through thick and thin. We were the best of friends, and I could always count on her when I was down. I guess I was a bit of a bitch about it then, um, because she didn't like for people to take advantage of her. Nobody does, and I always just knew that she would make time for me. Um, I was kind of popular and always busy when I was in school, so when we did hang out, it was on my terms. Uh, She looked up to me, and it felt good to have that, 
Um, but despite everything, I always believed that I was watching out for her as well. Anyway, as time goes on, we started baking, a simple little thing so we could spend some quality time together. Uh, we had bakery night all set up at her house, um, and it was a lot cheaper than going to a cooking class at the local college. I'm sorry, it's a little hard for me to talk about this. Just relax and talk. Talk at your own pace. Every Friday, we would meet up. It was the day of baking, cooking, and testing out new food. Um, it was fun. She was dieting a bit, but for me it was a good excuse to try new things. Her brother, um, we'll call him Stephen. Stephen used to watch us. I babysat him a few times when I was younger, and he'd always been a pretty okay kid. Um, a little bit weird, but romantic. His, his thing was to look at everything with a silver lining. He was always trying to be positive in front of me, even when I could see how much it was getting to him. Um, but he genuinely seemed like a nice kid. Uh, one day, after we finished one of our baking sessions, I found out that he had been baking as well. He joined in with his sister and I, and he'd been cooking, had some really good ideas and recipes for me, um, specifically me. Um, I would try his treats, and I would tell him how wonderful they were. Uh, he always seemed so happy when he heard stuff like that. Um, I told him that I didn't mind him baking things for me as long as they were all tasty. Um, looking back at it now, I guess, maybe there was some kind of warning sign there. Um, anyway, a few weeks later, uh, I started seeing somebody. Um, and he started to bake more for me. It was really weird. It was like the more I went out with my boyfriend, the quieter he was, and yet he would always have something for me. Every Friday he'd come back uh, and there would be muffins, cakes, tarts. Uh, he would insist that I try them and only I could try them. I didn't think anything was weird about it. Over a few weeks I started to notice that there was something a little strange. Uh, the food had a sort of a metallic taste to it. It wasn't noticeable at first, but you get so far through the cake and you would start to pick it up. I didn't think anything of it. I thought maybe he had been using some special spice. Uh, the taste eventually got stronger and stronger until it gave me a sick feeling in my stomach. I didn't want to hurt his feelings, so I thought I might try to get to the bottom of it myself and find the source. Um, one Thursday, I'd go into the kitchen. It crossed my mind that maybe he tried doing something with an old utensil and somehow the tarnish was coming off into the food. I don't know. I, I don't know what was going through my mind. I didn't think that I'd actually find anything. I had a spare key, so I just let myself into the house. As I went through the door, I heard a noise. There was a, a loud cursing up the short flight of stairs. The same curiosity that had brought me to the house in the first place brought me to the top of the staircase to see who it was pretty quickly. Um, I didn't know if it was my friend, her brother, one of her parents even. Um, well, the kitchen door was open in the slightest and there was a little stain on it, which in the back of my mind concerned me. Um, you know, I didn't know exactly what it was. I'd never seen it before, um, but I tried to ignore it. I walked through the door um, and I saw Stephen standing in the bathroom off the side of the kitchen and I could see that he um, that he had taken off the jacket and the gloves that he constantly wore. His hands were completely covered in cuts. Dozens and dozens of cuts and he was breaking them all open. His hands were completely covered in blood I can't even imagine how much that must have hurt. Part of me wanted to shout out and ask if he was okay, like to show some kind of concern, but what he did next made my blood curdle. He was, he was bleeding into a batter of some sort. He had been bleeding into the food that I had eaten. The cakes, muffins, everything he made for me. I felt so sick. I just ran out of the house, and I know he had to have heard me leave. He had to, but I don't care. I had just I just got out of there. I was too freaked out that that sick buck had been poisoning me with his blood. 
I don't know why. Um, but I went around the next day because I knew that his sister would be in and I knew that I needed to tell somebody what he was doing. As soon as I walked in, she handed me a box that he had uh, made up for me. Um, I avoided opening it for as long as I could. Um, and I just told her everything that was going on. And like any regular human being, she was disgusted by what I told her. I eventually mustered up the strength to open the letter that he had included for me. It read, I dream of you. I feel now's finally the time. Now you know how much I love you and how devoted I am to you. I'd give up everything for you. I would give my life for you. Every little bit, every little bit, every little taste you take brings me closer to you forever. Every time you feel, it feels like I'm there and we are slowly becoming one. I love you so much. I'm so upset that you've chosen your boyfriend. But now you and me have a closeness that he'll never be able to achieve that he'll never be able to achieve with you. I look forward to seeing how you've become and how our love will grow together. That sicko actually thought up those deranged words. That the two of us would become one if, if he did that to me. The two of us were going to have a kid or something. I don't know. I don't want to know. It freaked me out so much. And I told the family, and they said they have no idea. But somehow, it seemed to come as no surprise to them. Like I was the only one left out of some sort of sick joke. And they immediately spoke to the doctors about getting him treatment. He was hysterical when they showed up. He told them that they didn't understand us. He kept trying to reach for me. I could never forget his face as he was screaming and trying to hug me and hold me, confessing his love to me. This was the same kid that I had taken care of when he was a kid, like, like a child. And there he was, like a complete psychopath, screaming and writhing, trying to pull me into his arms. He showed me the cuts and scars and everything that he had done for me. He was sent to like a mental facility for observations, and I guess by that point he couldn't hide it anymore. I wish I had known. I wish I had figured it out, because how could I even guess something so fucked up? <sighs> okay. I developed somewhat of an eating disorder following all of that. I was completely repulsed by the thought of food, and I lost a lot of weight. But how could I eat or drink with the thought of eating another person, eating him, constantly in the back of my mind? It was the worst kind of nightmare that I just can't wake up from. He was inside of me. He violated me. No matter what I do, no matter how much I close my eyes to escape, I can still remember the look on his face. I remember all of it. Love. Such a powerful emotion. The emotion that lets you do anything for the object of your affections. Anything to make them happy with such a vague, blurry line between that we call love and complete and utter insanity. <laughs> now, do we have another caller lined up ready to put the chill in chilling out? Several calls are just absolutely perfect for tonight's show. But there's one caller who truly has something he's dying to share. Thank you so very, very much. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Boo! 
<laughs> Why, hello there, caller. I didn't think we'd hear from you again. Weren't we too weird and spooky for your usual tastes? Hey, you assholes keep clogging up the airwaves. I'm going to keep on calling. You guys are pretty good. You kind of spooked me tonight. Oh, well, thank you. Hey, don't get too smug, Mr. Microphone. Only reason you got a jump out of me is because I could have sworn I shut off the radio today. You did. But seriously, this shit's a total fucking waste. I mean, come on. All the listeners you got are just desperate little kids and baby goths. All running around, looking for boogeymen and monsters in their closet. What, are you that hard up for a good thrill that you gotta listen to these ass clowns? <laughs> you want a real spooky story? Go look in that damn mirror! All you sad losers think this is reality? You're the kind of fuck stains that I read about in the newspaper. Those troubled teens who end their lives because the real world is too hard to cope with. I mean, seriously. Anyone who listens to this tripe and enjoys it, or believes it, is obviously fucking mental. Ghosts, spirits, hauntings. And you're the worst of them all, Mr. Host Guy. You know this shit ain't real, but you're feeding the populace with this garbage. What's the matter? This really the best you could do? You flunked out of high school, and your only saving grace was landing a late-night radio show? Telling ghost stories to anyone gullible enough to believe it? You're a bigger waste of space than your audience. Get off the air, you fucking pansy! <laughs> Don't worry, listeners. You might think it's strange we let such an angry caller speak on the airwaves. But as I've always promised, this is your time to tune in and be heard. We silence no one. No matter what they utter or what they think about these broadcasts. If we were to pick and choose, then it wouldn't be your show, would it? No. It would be taken from you. And just be another boring sounding board like so many other broadcasts. We want you to put yourself into these calls, your heart, your fear, a little bit of you in every word uttered and every attentive listener out there listening, waiting, hanging on your every word. Now, on with the show, as they say. Our next caller was a little rattled by the previous caller's attitude. But don't worry. I've made sure they understood every word you spoke. And they're ready to be heard. Ah, so silver-tongued, you could charm a preacher to sin. Hello, caller. You are alive, alive, and all are attentive. I thought I'd tell you about my creepy-ass horror story that happened to me on Valentine's Day. My boyfriend, he's got this beat-up truck, and he decided we're going camping for Valentine's Day. Apparently, he doesn't have any family, and I'm living with mine. They know he's a good guy. I think they knew he wanted to pop the question. I mean, he did it a few months later. I don't know if maybe he hurried up due to the events that happened, or if he had already planned to do it. Anyways, he got us all packed up and got everything sorted and confronted everything to my mother and father, and the usual embarrassing things happened. They gave us a big stack of condoms and said, Look, we don't mind you having Valentine's Day together, as long as you don't have any kids close to Christmas. That gives us a great big laugh, and we eventually got into the truck and went. It was a beautiful lake with a beautiful campsite, quiet. Only a few people on it. So we've got this nice little patch, furthest one away from the campsite manager's office. We park and set everything up, tents and all. We even had a brief moment of where we put on our swimsuits and went to go swimming. Even though it's fucking freezing because it's February, you know. There's always people on this campsite, but only a few. It's too cold for most. Except those hardcore sports people. Anyway. We had a romantic night together. We did all kinds of stupid shit. 
We sat there, looking at the stars. We were having so much fun. Eventually, we got a little campfire going. Then, he decides that he's going to go take a leak. He disappeared out of sight, and he comes back, and when he comes back, he sits down. He's looking at me, smiling at me, reaching out and caresses my leg. Here, I'm looking so deeply into his eyes. I love this man. Everything about him. His smile is warm and inviting. And that's what I noticed. Looking over his shoulder... I see my boyfriend standing there, looking at me with the most confused look on his face. Who the fuck is that? He mouths, pointing to the back of the person that's sitting next to me. I look back at my fake boyfriend's face. His eyes are completely black, and his mouth is parted. I don't see any teeth, nor tongue, no gums, nothing but darkness in his mouth. And he looks back at me. I freak the fuck out, because he's still sitting there, but he's moving so slowly now, as he's trying to get up, still hunkered over. My boyfriend grabs me. We run past it, and to his truck. Soon as he started the engine, he fucking floors it. The tents are left, we put the fire out fast, and leave wherever the fuck that thing was out there. We hit the motorway, and we don't stop until we're back at home. My parents are going to get the shock of their lives. On the drive back, we're trying to calm ourselves down as we decide not to tell them the whole story. We just decide that we're going to tell them that the weather's bad. Not going to say there's a fucking doppelganger out there, or the fuck that was. I did a little research and I couldn't find anything matching what I'd seen. The inky blackness of love can seem as though it has no end in sight. It devours and destroys... Moves mountains, shakes the earth, launches fireworks, swallows up every single thing in its gaping nothingness and grants you nothing. Just feelings that could be so right, but also so very, very wrong and very, very dangerous. Aww. You'll scare our listeners if you keep that sort of talking up. If I scare our listeners with my simple prattlings and musings, then there must be something very, very wrong, because that isn't my job. All I do is call out to the listeners to call in. It's up to them to terrify and titillate. And now do we have another time for another caller? Glad to say that we do. So very glad. It must be something in the air, because this caller also has a tale of amour to share. One to chill to the very core. <laughs> it's time for one more of that. That is the very best news I've heard in a long time. Let's not wait. Put them through. Cola, please. Indulge us. Since everyone's sharing the hall of love stories, figured I might as well throw my hat into the ring. My friends were telling me the other day that old-fashioned love was dead. I'd always been a sucker for a real kind of romance. You know, you check them out, you see them and meet up for a drink. Maybe they're working a shift or something and they look in just the right way at the right time and say, Hey, I get off in an hour. Real cornball kind of stuff. I'm getting ahead of myself here. I've been trying for a few years to find a relationship. I hit 22 and finally decided to settle down. I had a small job and was working. I had my own place. It was a normal world, but at least I knew I had some job security and figured, hey, you know what? Let's add a little bit of romance in my life. I mean, hell, I don't want blue balls forever. I wanted someone I could come home to, someone I could be with, someone I could hold, embrace, all that sappy stuff you usually hear about love, but obviously with the added benefit of sex thrown in. Anyways, I started looking on Tinder and various chat websites, try to see if there was someone I could meet. They look for matches in your local area. I had been on a few dates and some of them were bland and had blown me off. I was sick and tired of them. 
one day I get a notification saying someone wanted to go out on a date. I thought, brilliant, great, wonderful. I said at that time, no problem. Well, there was a problem. I'm arranging to meet my date at 7 and I get a call from my boss saying I had to work at 9. Great. Absolutely marvelous. But still, working late and outside of my shifts meant extra money, so I was up for it. I sent a message to the person saying it was totally fine. It's a shame that they really wanted to see me, so I sent them a photo. No problem. And then they sent me one. It was of a street. I joked and said, oh, you're out for a walk, are you? And then they sent me another photo. I never gave out my address or anything. I just said that I wanted to meet up at this place. I mean, the place I chose was an hour or so away from anywhere I usually traveled. It was practically in the next town. End of the suburbs, even. Anyway, I get another message. They're at my apartment blocks. And I'm looking at a photo of my apartment. Then another photo. Three, in fact. The camera slowly panning to the left. The camera slowly panning up. Camera slowly zooming in on my room. No words. Just zooming in on my room. That freaked me the fuck out. They knew where I was and what was happening. I called my boss and said straight away I was going to have to enter my shift because something strange was happening. My boss didn't usually like that. I mean, he hated it if anyone came too early. But I guess he could tell there was something wrong with the way I said it. I figured maybe if I was quick enough, I could get downstairs and through one of the back doors and go out to my car. See, my apartment's got this weird, then where's that, this set of stage doors. There's no front door, so I could get out without them noticing me. I just cursed the fact that I'd give him a photograph of my fucking face. If I hadn't done that, maybe this would have been okay. And then I saw it. I looked out towards my window, and there was a hand at the glass. I'm five fucking stories up. How the fuck could there be a hand at my window on the glass? It wasn't a normal hand either. It was a horrible, wrinkled, dark, powdered, gritty kind of hand with weird-looking fingers. It dragged itself closer, and as it did, I saw the side of a head coming closer into view. I felt like I was paralyzed in fear. I saw one lone eye, wide and watery, blood red. I mean, blood red, like she had just been bleeding it, whatever. And the edge of the most twisted smile I had ever seen. I had turned and bolted from my door. Briefly, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. And I swear to God, it was the same fucking thing I was seeing on my window. I didn't stop to look. Any other time, if it was some sort of horror movie, you could definitely look around and see it was the same thing. I can't say that. I ran. And I ran down the stairs, jumped down five at a time, and practically twisted my ankle at the bottom, making a die for it. I fell and hit the ground, scrambled to my feet, and ran for my car. I ran until I got inside, started the engine, and drove. I was looking behind all the time. I was looking out the corner of my eyes, looking at the window. I didn't know what the fuck that was. I got to work, and I told my boss what happened. I was allowed to use the work phone to call the police. They checked my apartment for intruders, but there was nothing. There was a streak mark on the glass, but no sign of anyone being inside my apartment. They also cursed me for leaving the door wide open. Yeah, I probably did leave the door wide open when I ran out. I couldn't go back. Whatever the fuck that was, it knew where I lived, and all I did was show it a photo of my fucking face. Eventually, I was able to get a place with a young woman. She had a kid, and I'll be honest, I don't care if I sound like an asshole. I don't know if it's any kind of relationship I want to stay in at this moment of time, but I really don't have a choice. What are my options? Be alone? If I'm alone, I don't know if that thing's going to come after me. And if I'm alone, or if I'm not alone, will it still try to come after me? Go after her? I don't know anymore. I just feel like whatever it was... I went to my phone to try to check the messages. The scary thing is, they were all there. They hadn't just vanished. They hadn't just disappeared. The day I had been talking to someone who had an account, and the messages were there. The profile was gone, but the messages were all still there. So somebody had obviously written them. Somebody had obviously sent them. There had to be some way that I received this stuff from somebody. 
And I guess in some way that makes it worse. If it was like a horror story where all the messages had disappeared without a trace, I guess I would try to see the easy option and make it out that I had gone completely fucking insane, but I hadn't. There's proof. There's proof that I could show someone. I could show it to you now. And that makes everything even worse. Because if there's messages out there, I don't know if whatever sent them is still out there. If it's ready to prey on someone else. To think. Such an encounter would be avoided if not for that desire to be with someone. Letting desire override your senses all for the possibility of pleasure could end with a great deal of pain. Hopefully our show has made some of you more aware of the dangers in the darkness, or perhaps you do know, and that's why you listen to these tales. So you don't feel as alone or afraid, and you can cling to each other and ignore the feeling of cold fingertips dancing over your spine or grasping your shoulder. I'm afraid we need to go. Time's running short, and quickly. Yes, I see, yes, I understand. We shall have to love you and leave you, dear listeners, but the only thing you don't need to fear is that we will return with another broadcast for all of you who are brave enough to tune in to the Spirit Radio. From the producer and myself, your ghastly host, we shall await the time we grace the airwaves once more. Perhaps next time, the tales to be told will be your own.